the Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, a dog, a dragon, and a 16-pound Tasmanian crayfish that will take your thumb off. A science fiction breakfast of champions. A mass market barrage and the burdens of the dead. Plus, part seven of our continuing serialization of David Weber's Shadow of Freedom. All right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's our great honor to have you along. I'm Bain editor Tony Daniel. Coming up is our interview with Bain author and Tasmanian devil diver Dave Freer. The man writes high fantasy adventure and eats wallabies. Does that mean Dave's books always have a hoppy ending? We'll find out. We've also got a writing suggestion from a few good men author Sarah A. Hoyt in Part 7 of our Shadow of Freedom serialization. But first, Bain Associate Editor Laura Haywood Corey joins me for some news. May May Clue Clay! The May hardcover editions have been released to the wild, Laura. Are you excited? Yes, I am. Me too. These include Portal by Eric Flint and Reiki Spohr. This is the third book in the big finale to the Boundary science fiction series. We're going to have Eric and Reich on the pod in a couple of weeks to talk about Portal, among other things. Do you know what else is out in May, Laura? What, Tony? (laughs) House of Steel and the Honorverse Companion, which is one book. I notice you have a copy of that right there with you. Can you describe it for us? Yes, it's got a new uh, short novel in it by David Weber. And it's got lots of technical information with by the folks at uh, View 9. And it's got a full-color insert, 16 glorious full-color pages, uh, illustrating officer ranks, insignias, patch pins, uh, uniforms, and all sorts of exciting... Wow, that thing is cool. That is cool. I can't Six. remember if we've ever done a book with a big full-color insert like this before. It's gorgeous. Yeah, it's really beautiful. And Bu9 is the uh, the sort of David Weber, uh, not a fan club, their support group that keeps track of all the various aspects of the of the Honorverse and the Honor Harrington books. We're going to have a bunch of those Bu9 folks on, as a matter of fact, on the pod for a roundtable next week, and that should be very informative, and we'll get them to talk about this with us. We also have science fiction classics galore out in May. Uh, we have Transgalactic by A.E. Van Vo. Now, I shook the man's hand once and watched him brush his teeth, so I think I'm justified in pronouncing his name however I want. Do you agree, Laura? Or, well, are... I don't think he's around to argue with you, so <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. Transgalactic is three complete Van Vo novels, personally selected by Eric Flint and David Drake, who are around and might take issue with me at some point the pronunciation, but we'll all agree that these are great, great books, Uh, and they're all collected in a very handy mass market paperback size. What else have we got coming out, uh, science fiction classics and legend-wise, Laura? We've got uh, one of my personal favorite uh, Robert A. Heinlein books, The Star Beast, coming out in mass market paperback with a gorgeous cover by Bob Eggleton and a new afterword by Wynne Spencer. And that's not all. We also have an omnibus edition of Andre Norton's great novels, Here Abide Monsters and Yearth Burden. They're combined in a uh, omnibus edition called Children of the Gates, and it has a wonderful new cover by Stephen Hickman, who's been doing some gorgeous artwork for these new Andre Norton reprints. Oh, yeah, that thing looks good. Excellent, excellent. So there you have it. The Bain May hardcovers and originals in print in bookstores and at online booksellers now. Check them out. Very pleased to have Dave Freer with us today on the line from Flinders Island in Tasmania, where the wallabies roam. Hi, Dave. Hi, guys. G'day. Good day, in other words. Ah, uh, 
Thanks for the translation. What you'd say if you were actually going to be polite and greet someone around here. If you were going to be sort of normal, you'd say something like, piss off. I see. One of the interesting things about Australian society and South African society is that you tended to be very polite to people that you didn't like or didn't know. If they were friends of yours, you inevitably insulted them because then they'd know they were a friend of yours. <laughs> it's a very confusing thing. I had to explain it to Eric Flint a lot of times. Uh, well, actually, it makes kind of perfect sense, because they're the ones that aren't going to kill you if you say something wrong That's to right. them. <laughs> uh, Dave Freer is the co-author or author of a host of books, novellas, and short stories for Bane and beyond. Uh his debut novel was Solo Science Fiction Adventure, The Forlorn, in 1998. And since then, he's written A Mankind Witch, which I believe is also part of the Heirs of Alexandria series. And two books in the Dragon's Ring series, Dragon Ring, Dragon's Ring in 2009, and Dog and Dragon, which is just out in mass market paperback this April. Dave is also the co-author of books in several series with Eric Flint and Mercedes Lackey, including upcoming Heirs of Alexandria series entry in June, Burdens of the Dead. I'd also mention a favorite of mine, which is Dave and Eric Flint's wonderful little gem of an SF novel, 2008 Slow Train to Arcturus. Dave, was that a standalone novel, or was it part of a series? Well, I try to write all of these things as standalone novels, but it was intended to be part of a series, and um, my agent talked to uh, Tony at, at Bain, and apparently we're going to be doing some more of these books. I haven't got the details on this, but you know, I don't really mind. It'll come in at some stage. Can you explain the central conceit of that book? Because um, I thought it was brilliant. Well, what I did there was to give us an alien point of view character and from a species of alien which is humanoid to a large degree but has all sorts of things which we take for granted in humans for instance that we have two sexes now this particular species has two sexes unfortunately it's like a lot of the fish species in that it starts as one sex and then changes to the other sex and the young ones are male, which makes a lot of biological sense, and the older ones, of course, are female and become sessile and, well, nearly sessile and territorial. Um, so any exploring and dangerous things gets done by the young males, who then have to go home to change sex, rather like a salmon would go home to its own river. And of course, you can imagine a species like this then hitting the human race with two sexes and a very different way of looking at, at the universe. And the whole concept behind this is, is to exercise a bit of social satire by looking at our, our taboos and all of our preconceived notions about things and, and saying, well, how would that look to somebody who doesn't see sex the way we see sex? who doesn't think of territory the way we think of territory. And all of the and, all of the human the various because of the way that uh, it's a yeah. generation ship so various different ideas that humans have are presented in different portions of the generation ship is that correct? One of the big problems with, with a, a slow ship or a generation ship is that it takes you a very long time to get anywhere and when you get to the other place the other place might not be habitable, it might just be a very unwelcoming spot, and then you have to start all over again. And when you look at the big issue with traveling um, slower than light, it's not so much that it takes you so long to get anywhere at a third of light speed, which we could probably get up to, it's that getting to a third of light speed takes a long time, and then slowing down from a third of light speed takes a long time, and by the time you've done those two, you've, you've trebled your, your travel time. Um, so the whole idea behind this was that you'd speed up once um, with a string of modules instead of a single spaceship. 
and each one of the modules would be dropped off and colonize a separate environment. And this comes out of a, a discussion I had with Jim Bain ages ago. Instead of colonizing planets, the idea was that these guys were going to colonize habitable space um, and build space habitats around any star where you would always find a habitable zone of some sort. So it stopped mattering if the, the place that you went to sucked or not. But this meant that you had a whole long string of these different habitats. And of course, each of the habitats was taken up by a very different culture. Which you can imagine if you gave Americans the chance tomorrow of saying, right, well, all the people who really like uh, deer shooting, um, and deer shooting has been outlawed in the States, would like to emigrate to some other possible universe or uh, planet. And you can imagine them getting together and forming a habitat. All the people who believe in the great Ping Tong get together and form another habitat. The trouble is you have all these isolated cultures traveling across space for a very long time. And you kind of start looking at what happens to, to cultures in isolation and also possibly what it is about, well, I mean, part of this is in fact about the col co colonization of the U.S., um, where you developed a huge amount of hybrid vigor because you had all these different cultures coming in and influencing each other and coming together to form one American culture, um, which is the reverse of what you have in the slow ship. And you have the fragmentation that happens in each of these cultures, which, yeah, part of what the story was about. Yeah, they're, they, they diverge so much that they are almost alien. They're more alien between themselves, the human uh, populations mm -hmm. within the ship, than, than even the alien is from them. Some of them are so very different. Some of them are totalitarian, for instance, and some are, are not. I, I had a lot of fun having one actual sort of pacifist religious um, bead you know, unit and having to take one of the guys out of that and put him into some of the totalitarian sections along with this poor alien um, and to try and play sort of natural human reactions to to actually finding yourself in, in this set of circumstances. Yeah, I mean, I, part of that I took from my experience in the army where I was a medic and um, I did some time with some guys who went in as complete pacifists. You were in the you were in the South have, African army uh, yeah, as a medic. Yeah, going far away. Yeah, and, and you were on the border uh, of Angola, I believe. Is that correct? Yeah, there was there was a nasty little bicker going on for a while then. Um, we had Anzac Day today, which kind of all brought brought it all back a bit. It's interesting to see how, how a pacifist reacts to suddenly finding themselves in a situation where um, they are fight, facing a choice of, of violence or, or somebody that they are very fond of being killed. Um, yeah, kind of question I think that everyone should ask themselves somewhere down the line. So let's talk about Dog and Dragon, Dave. Uh, now, this is a story that is told in two parts. We have a uh, wonderful Rye Meb, who uh, reminded me of a plucky Andre Norton type of young heroine sort of uh, character. And this interdimensional dragon, Theon, and the super-intelligent sheepdog named Deleus, uh, who are her friends and who are seeking her across worlds and dimensions, they've lost her. Uh, one of the standout things about Dog and Dragon is that the world building, the world building feels so complete. Uh, I believe this is what Fionn calls the Celtic cycle of worlds. Um, can you explain a little bit what that means and what went into the creation of, uh, of the milieu and the world of Dog and Dragon? Okay. Why not, why not just have a quick PhD in, in two minutes? Um, <laughs> Maybe an overview. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, let's just talk about the idea that there are an awful lot of different planes 
of existence um, in different possible universes, and that the whole concept is that these would intersect somehow, and that um, the linking points would allow mythologies to spread across those points. So you've got the Celtic cycle of mythologies, then as you say, you've got that intersecting with the Norse, Norse cycle, which in turn would um, in, intersect with the Finica, Finoergic, I don't know how to pronounce these things, I read too much, um, and the Slavonic um, cycles, and so on, spreading out across the world like that. Yeah, the um, in this particular uh, world is Lioness, or Lioness, that mm-hmm. Neb has ended up in. And there are two uh, contending forces there that are that are using magic in various ways, and the the magic that you create also seems extremely logical and well thought out. And I was wondering if that I'm wondering if you in your mind it's it's science uh, if science had different premises that it started from. You, you got it in one, Tony. Um, my background and training is is as a scientist. While I enjoy fantasy a lot, I like a set of coherent rules and um, logical premises, and I really have an enormous problem with fantasy where there is no purpose to the magic. Um, it seems to me rather perpetual fiction. And Can you say that again? I think we lost, broke up a little there. Sorry. Um, I, I have a as a scientist, I have a big problem with magic that has no logical basis to it. And I like to um, construct things which have cause and effect, which have uh, some sort of conservation of energy and matter basis to them. Um, and in other words, you're right. Yes, I write magic as if it was science because I, I take it as, as being a possible science. Now, I've heard you mention uh, the, the Asian uh, sort of pseudo-magical practice of geomancy as, um, mm. as something that's involved with, and it seems like that uh, Fion, the dragon, who also can become a, a man-like creature in the book, uh, it seems like he his task is to sort of be the the feng shui master of uh, of the multiverse. Is that 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 would be a, a pretty good sort of assessment of it all? The idea being that by interlinking these various universes, um, you are forcing an unnatural energy pattern in between them and to make sure that the whole thing doesn't fly apart. Um, Somebody has to constantly rebalance things. And the positioning of objects, because this is a a geometric arrangement, the positioning of things is vitally important. And each of these things has its own um, magical resonance within the whole framework that you're talking about. So if you move one of them wrongly things start to fly apart and that's what Fion does is that he readjusts the whole system so it, it stays balanced and that un- maladjustment creates opportunities for stories uh, exactly every time things move around um, things have to be other we have, you can't move one thing without moving other things and um, some of those things of course are going to be people so let's talk about characters for a second. Now, Meb uh, is a very winning and wry sort of heroine. Uh, Theon is is pretty cynical in his way. He's he's seen everything. Um, and what are your what are your influences? Let's talk about that. Where because you have a wonderful dialogue. Your dialogue is is almost a sort of a, a living character in itself in the book to me. Um, they Theon is. Uh, is testing people every time he talks to them to see it's sort of a verbal uh, fight or sparring. There's definitely a bit of jousting going on there. Um, years ago, 
I started reading the Georgette Hare books, which are mostly Regency fantasy, or Reg- not fantasy, Regency romances. And the reason I, I really enjoy this is that this woman is probably the ultimate master of repartee between characters. And there are certainly some of those, um, the black sheep, for instance, where the story is irrelevant, in fact. It's the interaction between the characters and what they say to each other that is so entertaining. And I, I've always taken this as a kind of role model as, as to what I would really like to write. And um, if I'm actually getting that right, I'm really pleased. Well, I, I think you are. Um, we don't want to give the wrong impression about the book. There's plenty of action and fighting in it as well. Oh, yeah. You have a... I mean, the whole point is that um, fighting and action and romance, etc., don't necessarily mean that you have can't have good dialogue between your different characters. In fact, um, perhaps if you don't want to have dialogue in the middle of action, but certainly you can move a story along very nicely by having dialogue between the characters filling in the details rather than than the author just telling you about it. Let's move on for a second and talk about upcoming uh, Burdens of the Dead. I've tried in various ways over the years, uh, since I write a lot of the Bain ad copy and some of the flap copy and such, the Amazon descriptions and such, have for many years, uh, to characterize the heirs of Alexandria series in the best possible manner. Can, can you encapsulate it a bit? Right. Well, it's a, it's a big complicated series, so I, I don't blame you for having trouble. Try to get it um, into a hundred words sometimes. <laughs> yeah, that must be pretty tight, seeing as, as the first book was, uh, 280,000 words, I think. Um, and, that's probably more compressed than most people would have written it. Um, let, let's start by saying what we did deliberately was to write alternate history mixed with fantasy. In other words, we took Eric Strings, which is alternate history. That's Eric Flint, yeah. Eric Flint, yeah. And we took Misty's Strings, which is fantasy. Mercedes and then Lackey. they put a monkey in the middle to make a mess of it, me. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, what, what we did was to take a break point in history and say, had the great library in Alexandria not been destroyed, uh, magic and magical creatures would have continued to exist in the world. And the whole history of mankind would have been dramatically different. But on the other hand, history is, is retentive. Um, you know, some, sometimes one act by an individual might change things enormously. On the other hand, some things are almost inevitable um, and would not have been influenced by this. So it's a, a very careful sort of blending act between um, what possibly could have happened and the realities of the various things that came from the various parts of, of history. Uh, stupid examples. I mean, the cooking is, is my principal area of expertise, I suppose. And you have things spreading slowly across geographical space. Um, when we think of Indian cooking, you immediately think of, of what you guys would call Chiles? Chilies? How do you pronounce that in American? Uh, chilies, yes. Chilies, right? And chili peppers. Okay. Um, chili peppers, uh, which is so much a I... part of Indian cooking that right, yes. it's very hard for anyone to think of it not being there. But, of course, they're a native of the Americas, and they were actually brought to um, India by, by the various colonists or colonials coming across. Um, before that, pepper was a very big part of, of Indian cooking. Um, look at tomatoes. I mean, tomatoes were originally brought across as an ornamental plant. Uh, it took 
quite a while before people actually started to, to use them as a food plant. And can you imagine Italian cooking without tomatoes? Well, when you look at 15th century Italian cooking, it didn't have tomatoes. The whole way we look at, at the food and the culture and everything that evolves around that has to be very carefully worked out and thought out. So, yeah, we've ended up with a, an enormously complicated universe, which has been a lot of fun to, to work in, but has its own canon, which is now enormous. And um, I've, I've got to the stage where, where keeping one of these books in my head const means constantly referring back to our various bits of research and trying to work out exactly what I can and can't do. Eric Flint says that you write a lot of the Captain Benito Valdosta sections. Um, why, uh, he thinks it's because uh, you're a bit of a pirate and you take on any <laughs> any uh, trickster character. Why, why does this character appeal to you so much? Is Eric right? Well, Eric is usually right about most things, although you know, I, I would never admit that, that to him in public. Um, Benito particularly appeals to me because he, he climbs things. And I've been a rock climber for most of my life. Um, my, my introduction to rock climbing was that my brother and, and sister were supposed to be babysitting me. Now they're nine and ten years older than I am, and they were both rock climbing. And so my dad was off at sea, my mom was doing something or another. So they took me off to go rock climbing. And I think I was <laughs> seven or eight at the time. Don't tell me. They, they took you rock climbing as the babysitting? Uh... I didn't manage to bit the dummy or anything like that. I really enjoyed myself enormously. You apparently survived. So no, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> they may have dropped you on your head. And... They dropped me on my head a few times. That did me a lot of good. Well, you, you actually, I mean, you are a world-class climber as far as, I, I mean, you especially... Uh, I'm now getting quite elderly for a world-class climber. Yeah. My son is now a world-class climber. I but, still climb quite seriously, yes. And you can climb around uh, Flinders? as well. Yeah, it's got some of the best rock climbing in Australia. Um, sea cliffs, which appeals to me even more. And you thought those bits that I wrote about um, climbing up the outside of, of the castle in Corfu were written from imagination. I've actually climbed the outside of a castle. That was quite fun. I've always wanted but, to climb a castle when I saw one, and you've actually done it. Um, I've I've done a little bit of mountain climbing on occasion, but I, and I'm no slack in the outdoors. Uh, but I feel like a complete mm -hmm. dilettante in comparison to uh, some of the, you're a climber. You're you've been a commercial diver, and and I know from reading your Flinders Island blog that you go diving to put food on the table. And I saw a picture of this thing uh, that you caught barehanded that you call a crayfish. Now, I grew up in the south of America, of uh, the United States, and a crayfish is a little freshwater bug that, that um, it'll hurt you, but it, it's not a, you know, it's not huge. So, what are these things? Well, How do they taste? They were, they were what, what you'd call a spiny lobster. Um, you get something quite similar in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, except these are quite a lot bigger than those. Um, the biggest one I've caught was about nine and a half pounds. The biggest one I've seen, oh, it's been about 14 pounds. Um, I don't even want to go near a thing that size. It's probably pull me out to sea and eat me later. So you were, uh, the story on your blog is that you were, uh, you, you were spearfishing. And you were lined up to get a little one, and then you saw a big one. And can you tell us? <laughs> <laughs> well, I was, I spotted, well, we, you've got, these things live in holes on, under the rocks, underwater. And, um. You were scuba diving, uh, right? That's. Um, we're actually diving on a thing called a hooker, <clears throat> which is a compressor on the boat. Uh huh. So you, you can stay down for a long time. And, um, I was down there, I'd speared a small uh, sweet sea sweep, which is sort of a diamond-shaped fish, and looked into a hole a little later and spotted a small crayfish, and it's what we call a, a forever hole, because if you go into there, you're probably going to be in there forever. So I thought what I'd try is I, I'd stick my fish on the spear, and so I stuck the fish on the spear, and I was 
holding it out to this thing, and sure enough, it was slowly coming forward to have a bite of, of this dead fish. And I was lying in a kind of narrow crevice to get to this thing, holding the spear up and paying intense attention to the, the crayfish that was coming out towards me out of this dark hole. And you suddenly get this creepy feeling that there's something else moving near you. And I just sort of felt something touching my stomach. And there, sort of with two of his feet already on top of me, was this eight-pound lobster walking over me. So it was a case of drop your spear, grab the thing and hastily turn it over, because if you don't turn them over pretty quickly, um, their legs will go right in, and they've actually punctured people's chest walls and things like that. So you really have to move pretty fast. You don't squash them against your chest. Well, what you do is you flip, flip them onto their backs and you try and hold them by, they've got these two big uh, thorny antenna, and you try and hold them by the base of that. Unfortunately, I misjudged slightly and I got, got my thumb into what, what would be the equivalent of its um, claw. Did you get your revenge on this particular crayfish? <laughs> yeah, we ate him last night. Uh -huh. Fed nine people. Excellent. Dave Freer is the author of Dog and Dragon, book two in the Dragon's Ring series, and upcoming Burdens of the Dead with Mercedes Lackey and Eric Flint. He blogs lots of places, and you can find them all at DaveFreer.com. If you want to check out Dave's amazing lifestyle, you can go to his Flinders Island blog at FlindersFreer.blogspot.com. Dave, thanks so much for joining us today. It's been my pleasure. Our writing suggestion for this podcast comes from Bain author Sarah A. Hoyt. Sarah's Bane novels include the science fiction adventure, A Few Good Men. This is part of her Dark Ship series, with a really interesting examination of a libertarian future versus an autocratic future. Also coming this summer is Noah's Boy, which is contemporary fantasy and the continuation of her popular Shifter series. Lots of were creatures in that one. Now, Sarah, uh, we like to ask Bane authors for a weekly writing suggestion for our, our listeners. Now, this could be whatever you want. It's usually a seed crystal for a writer to take and shape into a piece of work. The result could be a paragraph, some flash fiction, a, heck, a whole novel or two if they can do it in a week, uh, which you probably can, Sarah. Uh, and perhaps uh, you have. It could be <laughs> difficult. I have only one. Um, uh, the, how about take something you do every day, apply what you foresee as future technology to it, and then go from there. Uh, so let's say eat breakfast. How will foreseeable or unforeseeable future technology affect your eating breakfast. Uh, you know, along these lines, uh, I used to read the paper every morning. Now I read blogs instead of the paper. It's a completely different process. In the same type of thing, you know, you're getting your cereal or whatever. How does this work and how does this affect other parts of, of your day and your life? And yes, I could spin a novel from that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you will. All right, so you writers out there, get your butts to the chair bottom and hands to a keyboard or pen or voice recognition software or however you do it and write for the stars and give us a, give us a peek at this. You can post this at the Bainspar forum for the podcast and perhaps some of you other listeners out there who are not uh, writers will take a peek at these and, and give some feedback to our writers in the audience as well. If I may, sure. that's the most important part of being a writer. Whether you feel like it or not, if you want to be a writer, set the time, and it can be, you know, half an hour if that's all you have, but set that time, sit down and write something. And now we continue with our most excellent audiobook serialization of David Weber's Shadow of Freedom. This portion of Shadow of Freedom is provided by Audible.com. 
Get the complete audiobook at audible.com now. If you're not a subscriber, you can get the entire audiobook free or choose from more than 100,000 other titles when you try Audible free for 30 days. I get a lot of reading done with audiobooks, and I've been using Audible for a long time. Okay, here's what has gone before. We open on Halkirk, a planet in the Loomis system, under the thumb of the autocratic Solarian League. The planet's bloodthirsty, tyrannical rulers are in cahoots with Solarian League interests to bleed the system dry of natural resources while keeping the inhabitants under the boot heel of the local dictatorship. It's not just Loomis. The entire frontier where the Solarian League butts up against the Talbot Quadrant is seething with unrest as the Solarian League begins to crumble. Admiral Michelle Hinkey, Countess Goldpeak, commands a ragged line of Royal Manticoran Navy ships. Goldpeak's every wish is to come to the aid of those who cry out for freedom from Sali domination, but she also knows a dangerous game is afoot to misdirect planetary rebels into thinking the RMN is going to show up with ships and arms and save the day for them. This is something Goldpeak does not have the resources to accomplish yet. The Manticoran system itself is still reeling after a devastating attack, and she is short of basic supplies and ammunition. But where there's a will, there's a way, and if there's an admiral who can find that way, it's Michelle Hankey, Countess Goldpeak. Here is Part 7 of David Weber's Shadow of Freedom. Chapter 6 This, Yana Tretyakovna announced, is boring. The tall, attractive, and very dangerous blonde flung herself backward into the threadbare armchair. She leaned back, crossed her arms, and glowered out the huge crystal-plast wall at what any unbiased person would have to call the magnificent vista of Yamato's nebula. At the moment, she was less than impressed. On the other hand, she had a lot to not be impressed about, and she'd had a lot of time in which to be unimpressed, too. I'm sure you could find something to amuse yourself, if you really wanted to, Anton Zilwicky said mildly, looking up from the chess problem on his minicomp. This is one of the galaxy's biggest and most elaborate amusement parks, you know? This was one of the galaxy's biggest amusement parks, Yana shot back. These days, it's one of the galaxy's biggest death traps, not to mention being stuffed unnaturally full of ballroom terrorists and Beowulf and commandos, not one of whom has a functioning sense of humor. Well... If you hadn't dislocated that nice Beowulfin lieutenant's elbow while arm wrestling with him, maybe you'd find out they had better senses of humor than you think they do. Yada, 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 Yana grimaced. It's not even fun to tease Victor anymore. A deep basso chuckle rumbled around inside Zilwicky's massive chest. When Yana had first signed on to assist in his and Victor Kashat's high-risk mission to Mesa, She'd been at least half frightened, whether she would have admitted it to a living soul or not, of the Havenite secret agent. She'd agreed to come along, mostly out of a desire to avenge her friend Lara's death, and she was a hearty soul, was Yana. Still, the notion of playing the girlfriend, although the ancient term mall might actually have been a better one, of someone many people would have described as a stone-cold, crazed, sociopathic killer, had obviously worried her more than she'd cared to admit. In fact, Zilwicky thought, Kashat had never struck him as either stone-cold or crazed, but he could see where other people might form that impression, given his Havenite colleague's body count. As for sociopathy, well, Zilwicky's internal jury was still out on that one in some ways. Not that he hadn't known some perfectly nice sociopaths. Besides, Zilwicky had observed that who was the sociopath and who was the defender of all that was right and decent often seemed to depend a great deal on the perspective of the observer. And sometimes the cigar really is a cigar, of course, he reflected. That's one of the things that make life so interesting when Victor's around. Over the course of their lengthy mission on Mesa, 
Yana had gotten past most of her own uneasiness with the Havenite, and the four-month voyage from Mesa back to the Hainuele system had finished it off. Of course, the trip shouldn't have taken anywhere near that long. The old, battered, and dilapidated freighter Holly Soul, their Erewhonese contacts had provided, had been a smuggler in her time, and she'd been equipped with a military-grade hypergenerator. It wasn't obvious, because her original owners had gone to considerable lengths to disguise it, and they hadn't tinkered with her commercial-grade impeller nodes and particle screening, but that had allowed her to climb as high as the theta bands, which made her far faster than the vast majority of merchant vessels. Unfortunately, the hypergenerator in question had been less than perfectly maintained by the various owners through whose hands the ship had passed since it was first installed, and it had promptly failed after they managed to escape Mesa into Hyper. They'd survived the experience, but it had taken Andrew Artlett what had seemed like an eternity to jury-rig the replacement component they'd required. They'd drifted, effectively motionless on an interstellar scale, while he and Anton managed the repairs, and even after they'd gotten the generator back up, using the Mesa-Visigoth hyperbridge had been out of the question. They'd been better than 960 light-years from their base in Hainuele, and well over a thousand light-years from Torch, but given the pyrotechnics which had accompanied their escape, they dared not return to the Mesa Terminus and take the shortcut which would have delivered them less than sixty light-years from Beowulf. Instead, they'd been forced to detour by way of the OFS-administered Siu-Tang Terminus of the Siu-Tang-Olivia Bridge, then cross the 480-odd light-years from the Olivia system to Hainuele the hard way. The trip had given them plenty of time to hone their card-playing skills, and the same enforced confinement had given the coup de grace to any lingering fear Yana might have felt where Victor Cachat was concerned. It had also given Cachat and Zilwicky plenty of time to debrief Erlander Simois, the Mason physicist who had defected from the Mason alignment. Well, plenty of time was probably putting it too strongly. They'd had lots of time, but properly mining the treasure trove Simois represented was going to take years, and it was, frankly, a task which was going to require someone with a lot more physics background than Zilwicky possessed. Enough had emerged from Simois's responses and from the maddeningly tantalizing fragments which had been proffered by Jack McBride, the Mason security officer who'd engineered Simois's defection, to tell them that everything everyone, even or perhaps especially the galaxy's best intelligence agencies, had always known about Mesa was wrong. That information was going to come as a particularly nasty shock to Beowulf intelligence, Zilwicky thought, but Beowulf was hardly going to be alone in that reaction. And as they'd managed to piece together more bits of the mosaic, discovered just how much no one else knew, their plodding progress homeward had become even more frustrating. There'd been times, and quite a few of them, when Zilwicky had found himself passionately wishing they'd headed towards the lynx terminus of the Manticoran wormhole junction instead. Unfortunately, their evasive routing had been more or less forced upon them initially, and it would have taken even longer to backtrack to lynx than to continue to Siu Tang. And there'd also been the rather delicate question of exactly what would happen to Victor Cachat if they should suddenly turn up in the Manticore binary system especially after the direct Havenite attack on the aforesaid star system, word of which had reached the Mason news channels just over two T months before their somewhat hurried departure. It had struck them as unlikely that one of Haven's top agents would be received with open arms and expressions of fond welcome, to say the least. For that matter, exactly who had jurisdiction over Simois and the priceless intelligence resource he represented was also something of a delicate question. Their operation had been jointly sponsored by the Kingdom of Torch, the Republic of Haven, whether or not anyone in Nouveau Paris had known anything about it, the Audubon Ballroom, the Beowulf Biological Survey Corps, and Victor Cachat's Erewhonese contacts. There'd been absolutely no official Manticoran involvement, although Princess Ruth Winton's contributions hadn't exactly been insignificant. She'd been acting in her persona as Torch's intelligence chief, however, not in her persona as a member of the Star Empire of Manticore's ruling house. Bearing all of that in mind, there'd never really been much chance of heading straight for Manticore. Instead, they'd made for Hainuele, on the direct line to Torch. 
It was the closest safe harbor, given the available wormhole connections, and they'd hoped to find one of the BSC's disguised commando ships in system and available for use as a messenger when they got there. They'd been disappointed in that respect, however. When they arrived, the only ship on station had been EMS Custis, an Erewhonese construction ship which had just about completed the conversion of Parmley Station into a proper base for the BSC and the ballroom to interdict the interstellar trade in genetic slaves. Artlet's and Zilwicky's repairs had been less than perfect, and Holly Sol had limped into Hainuele on what were obviously her hypergenerator's last legs. Custis's captain had been out of touch for two or three months himself while his construction crews worked on Parmley Station, but he'd been able to confirm that as far as active operations between Haven and Manticore were concerned, a hiatus of mutual exhaustion had set in following the Battle of Manticore. Both Anton and Victor had been vastly relieved to discover that no one had been actively shooting at one another any longer, given what they'd learned on Mesa, but it had been obvious the good captain was less than delighted at the notion of finding himself involved in the sort of shenanigans which seemed to follow the team of Zilwicky and Kashad around. He'd apparently suspected that his Erewhonese employers wouldn't have approved of his stepping deeper into the morass he was pretty sure Holly Soul and her passengers represented. They might have convinced him to change his mind if they'd told him what they'd discovered on Mesa, but they weren't about to break security on that at this point. Which meant the best he'd been willing to do was to take his own ship to Erewhon, which, to be fair, was the next best thing to twenty light years closer to Hainuele than Torch was, to fetch back a replacement generator for Holly Soul. In the process, he was willing to take an encrypted dispatch from Victor to Sharon Justice, who'd been covering for him as the Republic's senior officer in Erewhon sector, but that was as far as he was prepared to go. Zilwicky didn't try to pretend, even to himself, that he hadn't found the captain's attitude irritating. Fortunately, he was by nature a patient, methodical, analytical man, and there were at least some upsides to the situation. Neither he nor Kashat wanted Simois out of their sight, and while they had no particular reason to distrust Custis's captain or crew, they had no particular reason to trust them either. If even a fraction of what Jack McBride and Airlander Seamoise had told them proved true, it was going to shake the foundations of star nations all across explored space. They literally could not risk having anything happen to him until they'd had time for him to tell his tale, in detail, to their own star nation's intelligence services. Much as they might begrudge the month or so it would take Custis to make the trip to Erewhon, they preferred to stay right where they were until Justice could arrange secure transport to Torch. They'd both breathe an enormous sigh of relief once they had Simois safely squirreled away on Torch and could send discreet dispatches requesting all of the relevant security agencies send senior representatives to Torch. No one expected it to be easy, and he knew Kashat was as worried as he was over the possibility that the Star Empire and the Republic might resume combat operations while they waited, but both of them were aware that they'd stumbled onto the sort of intelligence revelation that came along only once in centuries. Assuming it wasn't all part of some incredible, insane disinformation effort, the Mason Alignment had been working on its master plan for the better part of 600 T years without anyone's having suspected what was happening. Under those circumstances, there were, quite literally, no lengths to which Victor Kashat and Anton Zilwicky wouldn't go to keep their sole source of information alive. Which was why they were all sitting here aboard Parmley Station's moldering hulk while they awaited transportation elsewhere. You know, Yana said a bit plaintively, nobody told me we were going to be gone on this little jaunt for an entire year. And we haven't been. Zilwicky pointed out. Well, actually, I suppose we have, depending on the planetary year in question. But in terms of T years, it's been less than one. Why, it's been barely ten T months when you come down to it. And it was only supposed to be four, Yana retorted. We told you it might be five, Zilwicky corrected, and she snorted. 
You know, even Scraggs can do simple arithmetic, Anton, and... The power door giving access to the combination viewing gallery and sitting room was one part of Parmley Station which had been thoroughly refurbished. Now it opened rather abruptly, interrupting Yana in mid-sentence, and a dark-haired man came through it. Compared to Zilwicky's massive musculature and shoulders, the newcomer looked almost callow, but he was actually a well-muscled young fellow. Ah, there you are, he said. Ganielle said she thought you were in here. And so we are, Victor, Zilwicky rumbled and raised an eyebrow. And since we are, and since you're also here at the moment, may I ask who's babysitting our good friend Erlander? Unless I'm mistaken, it is your watch, isn't it? I left Frank sitting outside his door with a flechette gun, Anton. Kashat replied in a patient tone, and Zilwicky grunted. The sound represented at least grudging approval, although one had to know him well to recognize that fact. On the other hand, Frank Gillich was a capable fellow. He and June Matis were both members of the Beowulf Biological Survey Corps, part of the original BSC team, which had discovered the Butri clan here on Parmley Station and brokered the deal that left the Butris alive and turned the station into a BSC ballroom front. Most people, or most people who didn't know Victor Kashad at least, would have considered Gillich and Mates about as lethal as agents came, and Zilwicky was willing to concede that Gillich could probably be counted upon to keep Simois alive for the next fifteen or twenty minutes. I thought I was the hyper-suspicious, paranoid, obsessive-compulsive one, Kashat continued. What is this? Are you trying to claim the title of paranoiac in chief? Ha! <laughs> Yana snorted. He's not trying to do anything. He's just been hanging around you too long. That's enough to drive anyone, except Kaja, maybe, around the bend. I don't see why the entire universe insists on thinking of me as some sort of crazed killer, Kashat said mildly. It's not like I kill anyone who doesn't need killing. He said it with a completely straight face but Zilwicky thought it was probably a joke. Probably. One could never be entirely certain where Kashat was concerned, and the Havenite's idea of a sense of humor wasn't quite like most people's. May I assume there's a reason you left Frank playing babysitter and asked Ganiel where you might find us? Zilwicky asked out loud. Actually, yes. Kashat replied, dark brown-black eyes lighting. I think I've finally found the argument to get you to agree to take Erlander straight to Nouveau Paris, Anton. Oh? Zilwicky crossed tree-trunk arms and cocked his head, considering Kashat the way a skilled lumberjack might consider a particularly scrubby sapling. And why should we suddenly depart from our agreed-on plan of parking him on torch and inviting all the mountains to come to Mohammed. Because, Kashat replied, a dispatch boat just came in from Erewhon. A dispatch boat? Zilwicky's eyes narrowed. Why would anyone in Erewhon be sending a dispatch boat out here? Apparently, Sharon decided it would be a good idea to let anyone from the ballroom or the BSC who checked in with Parmley Station know what's going on, Kashat replied. He shrugged. Obviously, she didn't know I was going to be here when she sent the boat. She sent it off about three weeks ago, and the earliest Custis could get to Erewhon is tomorrow. I'm perfectly well aware of Custis's schedule, Zilwicky rumbled. So, suppose you just go ahead and tell me what's going on that's so important your minions are throwing dispatch boats around the galaxy? Well, it happens that about three months ago, Duchess Harrington arrived in Haven Orbit, Kashant said. The news got sent out to all of our intelligence stations in the regular data dumps, 
but it still took over a month to get to Sharon, and she sent the dispatch boat out to distribute it to all our stations in the sector. It stopped off at Torch, too, according to its skipper. We were the last stop on the information chain. He shrugged again. I imagine the only reason it got sent here at all was Sharon's usual thoroughness. But according to the summary she got from the home office, Duchess Harrington is in Nouveau Paris for the express purpose of negotiating a peace settlement between the Republic and the Star Empire. Anyone who knew Anton Zilwicky would have testified that he was a hard man to surprise. This time, though, someone had managed it and his eyes widened. A peace settlement? You mean a formal treaty? Apparently, that's exactly what she's there to get. And according to Sharon's summary, President Pritchard is just as determined as the Duchess. On the other hand, after 20 years of shooting at each other, I doubt they've already tied it all up in a neat bow. And since Duchess Harrington actually believed both of us before we ever set out for Mesa, I don't see any reason she wouldn't believe us if we turned up with Simois in tow. For that matter, she'll have her tree cat with her, and he'll know whether or not we're telling the truth, or whether or not Airlander is when you come down to it. And if there's anyone in the Star Empire who could convince the Queen to listen to us, it's Harrington. Zilwicky agreed, nodding vigorously. Exactly. So my thought is that we leave the recordings of our interviews with Airlander here on our station to be picked up by the next BSC courier to come through and taken on to Torch. Redundancy is a beautiful thing, after all. In the meantime, though, you and I commandeer Sharon's dispatch boat, load Airlander on board, and head straight for Haven. Kashant grinned. Do you think finding out about the Alignment's existence might have some small impact on the negotiations? That was David Weber's Shadow of Freedom, Part 7, read by Allison Johnson. And now it's g'day for this podcast. Thanks to Audible.com. Thanks to Laura Haywood Corey and musical composer Ruth Judkowitz, creator of the anthemic March to the Stars. Circumpolar Aurora Borealis, thanks to Dave Freer and to you, listener. Please join us next time here at the pounding heart of science fiction and fantasy and keep reaching for the stars. <laughs>